Hello, church. Welcome. We are so glad that you could join us for what will hopefully be one of our last online only worship services. Uh, soon we do plan to meet in person, those who wish to. We still plan to live stream our services as well, of course, as we were doing for years before the pandemic hit. Um, and you'll be able to connect with us uh, to those services online still through our Linktree portal, which we'll keep using. But again, for those who want to join us in person, that will be uh, possible very soon. The location is going to be at 270 Girard, and we'll be back, back into the gym. So anyway, so today we're going to talk about worship. We're going to talk about worship. And worship is a really important word. In a sense, it's a universal word because uh, everybody worships something. Uh, someone said that, uh, I think actually it was Blaise Pascal who said, there is a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of every person which cannot be filled by any created thing, but only by God, the creator, made known through Jesus Christ. Again, uh, there is a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of every person which cannot be filled by any created thing, but only by God, the creator, made known to us through Jesus Christ. And so for followers of Jesus, uh, really worship is, is the most important thing we do, I believe, that prepares us to be salt and light in this broken world that God loves so much. Worship prepares us to love God. It prepares us to love others. It prepares us for service, and it grounds us in the authority of Scripture and in the presence of God. And our whole lives need to be grounded in the authority of Scripture because all kinds of other things are competing for dominance in our lives, but the Word of God must remain front and center and, and worship grounds us in the presence of God. Um, as Pastor Arlene was saying that uh, if we don't spend time in the presence of God, uh, even just the, the, the reading of scripture can become a reading of text that can end up becoming stale. So it's so important uh, to be in the presence of the living God. And, um, and yeah, so we're talking about worship today. And, and I think we understand that, that worship is not just singing songs to God, right? I think we, we get that. Uh, you know, in a public service of worship, um, which is one way that we worship, uh, whether online, like uh, in the service or in person, uh, worship also includes the hearing of the word of God, it includes the prayers, it includes the announcements, it includes the passing of the peace, whenever we'll be able to return to that. It, it includes the, the offering, uh, every aspect of the public uh, worship service. And, and so when we do come to worship on Sunday, we come to do and to be a part of an important thing which can, if we let it, uh, contribute to real change in our lives. Let's look at today's passage a little more closely. Actually, I'm a little big there. Let me move myself over here. There we go. That's good. So it says, the beginnings, it says, uh, praise the Lord, my soul. I will praise the Lord all of my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. And so, so this psalm that we're looking at today, Psalm 146, and, and I do encourage you to have your, your Bible open as well uh, as, you're, as you're following along, uh, or maybe on your phone, if you can sort of do that. Um, it's, uh, it, it actually starts with two encouragements, two exhortations. The first one is general. It says, you know, praise the Lord. Uh, and it says that to the gathered congregation, so to speak. Um, we are here to praise the Lord. We are here to give thanks to God together, to, to lift our voices in exaltation to him. We're here for him, not for us. It's his glory that we seek first, not that we are uplifted. We and our needs are so, so important to God, but they are always secondary to true worship. God is the reason and the focus of our worship. And that's not an unimportant detail. I, I heard of a man um, who approached a worship leader after a service uh, somewhat aggressively just to say that he really didn't enjoy the service at all. And the worship leader said in a kind tone, well, then I'm glad we're not here for your entertainment. We're here to exalt Jesus Christ. There you go. So, so next we read, um, 
praise the Lord, all, oh my soul. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. So the psalmist is talking to himself here. He's saying, you know, praise the Lord, oh my soul. He's telling himself to be a part of that praising of the living God that's going on in the congregation to make sure that he's entering in to what is happening among the people of God. So we're exhorted to praise the Lord, oh my soul. And, and, and that is a call to, to step out of ourselves, uh, out of our confusion, uh, out of our turmoil, perhaps, uh, even out of the general condition of our lives, be it good or, or rough at the moment, and enter instead really into kind of like a laser focus on the living God, a laser focus on the living God. And if you've ever thought uh, that you have nothing to give God, you need to know that the thing he wants from you the most is not your activity. It is not your works. He wants your faith in him to be expressed in worship, to enjoy the living presence of the living God. Yeah, so, so uh, worship has everything to do with you and me aligning ourselves with God, with the truth, aligning ourselves with what is true, with the word of God, aligning ourselves with the person of God who is our creator and our redeemer and the lover of our souls. And, and so as we continue to, you know, to, to be involved week after week, participating actively in worship, um, again, with that laser focus on God, and, and, and hopefully as we worship in prayer and pray, and read scriptures on our own, uh, as those become kind of more and more normalized activities in our own day-to-day -day lives, something really, really marvelous begins to happen. Uh, in fact, all of the time that we spend in God's presence, whether by ourselves, kind of on our own, which we need to do, or together with the body of Christ, or even just with a couple of friends, all the time that we spend in God's presence has the impact on us of changing us, of transforming us more and more to be like Jesus, God's son. And so the psalmist simply says, you know, um, to give praise to him. Give praise to him. What do you praise God for? What do you praise God for? When does uh, worship well up in you? You know, uh, for some people, it's when they see creation. Uh, when uh, For some people, it's, it's kind of when you see a life being transformed. Um, uh, you know, or sometimes, you know, it can be when you sense him in your pain. Sometimes it can be uh, when you, you feel his presence in your suffering. Um, uh, uh, perhaps when you feel your, uh, his pleasure in your obedience to him, uh, you know, or maybe when you come in contrition uh, and humbly and in confession in order to be restored, like Peter was restored, uh, like King David was restored after some pretty serious missteps, serious sins. Or, or maybe, you know, worship is um, kind of a weird concept to you, uh, you know, coming from a background where there was no concept of God uh, I was from an atheist background it was weird for me I'll tell you you know but but I but I did learn and um, in terms of figuring out what was going on around me when it was really quite a mystery in the early days I did learn early on that it starts with gratitude gratitude thankfulness thankfulness for who God is first of all and for what he has done for us through Jesus. So it's thankfulness for who God is and for, and for what he's done for us in Jesus. Um, uh, Pastor Charles Spurgeon uh, said, praise is the honey of a life which a devoted heart extracts from every bloom of providence and grace. Praise is the honey of life which a devoted heart extracts from every bloom of providence which is God's providing for us and his grace which is his unmerited favor. So the psalm um, points really to this decision that we make to live in praise of God throughout our whole lives as long as we live. And that uh, honestly means a great deal because you know, as I know, that there is so much suffering in life. There is so much hardship, uh, you know, for a year and a half now or more, um, you know, so many have been living in such isolation. Um, but, but it's really important to know that at the very least then, 
um, you know, choosing to worship God, choosing to focus my energies on him is to make a decision that I'm, I'm never going to, I'm not going to shift my perspective. I'm not going to shift my vantage point from being a person who's going to praise God, uh, who will have my eyes wide open to the reasons to praise God. And, and I'm going to be a person who will never allow anything to alter my course from being a person who, who lives in praise of the living God. That's just so important that we make that determination that we will never allow anything to alter the course from being people who live in praise of the living God. And, and really to, to, to get there, we really have to think about suffering and not just when it hits us, right? We tend to think of suffering when it hits us. I've known uh, Christians who kind of gone along fine and, th and then they hit some hardship and all of a sudden it's how could I possibly suffer? How could I possibly suffer if God is good? When the, the truth is that Every single moment of every day, someone on this planet is suffering. We have to work through suffering. We have to develop a healthy theology of suffering. Otherwise, when it hits us, um, we're just kind of not going to be mature enough to be able to handle that, right? So, so we need to be people who, who make the decision that we're never going to do anything. We're never going to allow anything to alter uh, us from being people who live in praise of the mighty God. You know, I'm going to take care of my faith. I'm going to be a steward of this precious gift, and I'm never going to allow anyone or anything to compete in my heart for that position of my first love. I'm not going to allow anyone to uh, compete in my heart for the position of my first love that belongs to God alone, belongs to Jesus alone. But should that ever happen, because guess what? We're human. We're also going to keep short accounts and we're going to repent of that sin if, if we should fall into it. And we're going to return to God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit as our first love at the shortest, at the earliest possible opportunity. And we need to do that. That's kind of what it means to be like really committed to this. And uh, there's an important idea that is connected to worshiping God that the psalmist talks about next in our psalm today, 146, something that, that flows quite naturally out of genuinely worshiping the living God. And so that's this part. Let me just move myself again. A little too large there. Uh, it says, do not put your trust in princes, in human beings who cannot save. Uh, when their spirit departs, they return to the ground. On that very day, their plans come to nothing. Blessed are those whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord their God. Can you say amen? And say amen. So the trust in God that we have, you know, be it little like a mustard seed, or maybe it's we've had it for a while, so it's been growing. Our, our confidence in God's uh, faithfulness, our confidence in God's goodness, in the truth of his own beauty, that grows again, and it grows, and it grows. And as we trust God, we live more at peace. We live more at peace. And the peace that we have is less likely to be kind of shattered by stuff that happens externally around us. You know, so, so we live in the knowledge of his sovereign grace, uh, his love over our lives. Uh, when we really are coming to know God, you know, we know that there is no one and there is nothing like him. There is nothing that approaches the holiness and the otherness and the majesty uh, uh, and the worthiness of the living God. You know, like you, I've known times of struggle. I've known times of really not having a, a clear idea of the way forward. And in my own life and in the lives of a lot of people that I pastor, that I journey with, you know, I've lived through kind of great struggle and great anxiety. And, and those times are always opportunities to get stressed out, right? Here's an opportunity to get stressed out, to worry about what is entirely out of our control, uh, to fixate on the problem uh, when the solution is beyond or way beyond our immediate grasp. But you know what? Those are also opportunities to draw near to God and to simply breathe, to sit in the presence of God, really mindful of his, of his goodness and, and his truth, and to simply breathe. Maybe for you that means turning on some worship music. Maybe it means listening to some classical music or maybe jazz or something. Um, or maybe it just means sitting quietly, you know, um, to kind of lay down the concern, lay down the stress, lay down that worry at his feet. See, the truth is that when you focus on your problems, when we focus on our problems, they can drown us. Our problems can drown us. But when we focus on praising the Lord, our, our soul feels relief. 
And, and there's this interesting thing that the quieter you become before the Lord, the more you can hear, right? And it's possible to discipline ourselves, to focus on prayer and gratitude, rather than to spend that very precious energy on worry, which again, never yields anything good. So the time and energy that we spend worrying, it's kind of like it just goes out into this void and it gets lost. Nothing fruitful ever comes from worrying. But, but when we focus instead to, um, you know, when we choose to focus that precious energy on prayer and praise to the living God as an act of worship, that's like a totally different approach that leads to a totally different outcome. It increases our connection to God, um, kind of the same way that, you know, talking with a friend uh, enhances and grows your feeling of connection to them. Choosing to uh, have that conversation with God, choosing to pray, to offer gratitude to God, that's time and it is thought and it is energy that kind of goes out from us and it's found. And it's found by the living God who loves us. What could be better? Honestly, what could be better? And that's why, you know, people often say that it's through the toughest times that they sense the most growth in themselves. Very often people don't really notice that at the time, but coming out of the hard time and looking back, if they're able to get a clear line of sight on, on kind of who they were and where they are now, um, it's through those times that people get a sense of um, uh, that they've really been growing. You know, circumstances have forced them really to press into God. And then that the, the, the benefit of that added time of closeness with the lover of our souls gives us strength and it gives us power in our lives that nothing else comes close to giving. It's kind of like James, uh, he says this in, um, in chapter four of his, uh, his letter, he says, uh, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Well, you know, what can keep us from that drawing near to God? What can cause us to be, you know, double-minded? What can cause us to be double-minded? Um, and the answer in part is, is actually kind of related to trust. It can be do, to do with dividing our trust, perhaps, you know, diluting our worship, diluting our devotion to God um, with something other than God right? Something, um, and that can even be like other people. Um, it can be anything else that we might uh, kind of go to uh, for solace when we really need to be going to God. And so, so the psalmist um, really actually encourages us to, to not trust in people, to not place our primary trust in powerful people, to not place our trust in princes, if you notice it says there. And um, the, the modern day equivalent of that would be leaders, it would be like mayor, uh, you know, premier, prime minister uh, in, in, this, in Canada. Um, and, um, and yeah, so, so, so God does not want us to put our confidence in human beings who cannot save. If we do that, that will kind of dilute our energy, dilute our focus, which is really intended uh, to be on him so that we are at our healthiest best. Instead, he really wants our whole commitment to be to him because that's, you know, he knows that's when we thrive. That's when we come alive. Um, five years ago, I, I had the, the pleasure of marrying off my daughter, Ilya, to her fiancé, uh, Stephen. It's weird just to say that because in my brain, I can still imagine Ilya at three years old. But nevertheless, five years ago, I had the pleasure of marrying off my daughter, Ilya. And one of the things I said to them um, uh, is, for instance, I said to Stephen, you know, when you say I do to Ilya, what you're also saying, just so you know, is I don't to all other women. And I said to Ilya, when you say I will, to Stephen, you are also saying, I won't, to all other men, right? So there's this uh, exclusivity to, uh, to the sacred thing that is marriage. Uh, it's a sacred agreement, covenant. Um, and in order for it to be and remain sacred, it's between two people. It's a promise that is made that honestly takes a lifetime to fulfill. And, and, and um, it's an extraordinarily beautiful union, actually, that Jesus celebrates in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 19, um, even as he's answering people's questions uh, about divorce. It's, it's a covenant, right? And, and if the covenant is violated because somebody else is brought into the relationship who does not belong, uh, who can only threaten the very well-being of the marriage, um, that is that is 
terrible and and uh, and we need to protect against that very actively um and and so that's like a human relationship and and probably the most important well definitely the most important human relationship is with our spouse but our relationship with god is not far off that in a way it is a covenant between us and god uh, god loves us because he does and because he grants us saving faith we love him back when you and i come to worship god we're really what we're doing is we're reaffirming that we love him above all things we're reaffirming this truth that we love him about above all things we will not entertain idols we will not submit to other gods that are no gods we will not divide our loyalties god alone god alone is worthy of our worship he alone is uncreated of all things. Everything else is created. God alone is uncreated without beginning, without end. Everything else returns to the ground and kind of turns to nothing. God alone is eternal. And through the gift of faith in Jesus Christ, we um, have the promise of eternity with him in glory. So the psalm that we're looking at is a reminder to, to, for us to know that our help comes from the Lord and, and to place our hope in the Lord very actively, not just to kind of assume that because like a, a month ago or six months ago or six years ago, I was all good, but I haven't given it much thought like that. No, it's every day. Uh, and then, you know, for sure, in a regular interval, like a, a weekly to, to come back and to remind ourselves that we're going to place our hope in the Lord. Um, and and uh, he alone cannot and will not disappoint us when we place our trust in him. And so we have uh, uh, the rest of the psalm. And uh, there's, there's a fair bit there, as you see right there. And, um, and, uh, so the rest of the psalm gives us some good reasons to live in praise of the living God. Uh, first off, uh, God is incredibly powerful and creative. Uh, he created the entire natural order of things, things in the heavens above us, things on this earth, uh, all the natural things in the sea, the sea itself. Uh, that should be mind boggling enough to us. And I didn't really even mention the, you know, you know, the celestial kind of universes upon universes that continue to expand weirdly. Um, you know, um, before my dad kind of softened his heart toward God, um, my dad was an artist. Uh, and, um, and this is, uh, these are some, some pictures of my dad. I really, really, really love my dad. Maybe you can see the resemblance. But before he softened uh, toward God and repented of his sins and received Jesus as his Lord and Savior, which he did a few months before he passed away, actually, um, he would often sit at his art, art, art desk or he would stand at one of these large murals over here and uh, he'd be, be, be presiding over his uh, impressive artistic creations, his paintings and murals. And uh, he was really, really good. Um, he was called a gentle genius by his friends. Um, you know, whenever I would come up to his studio, because he had a studio at the, what we call the cottage near Oxford bridge um he would sometimes he would sometimes talk in a big old voice uh, about being the creator of the particular piece that he was working on uh, he'd point to some of the characters in the painting and he would act like he was god over their lives and most of the time i think he was like kidding um sometimes i wasn't entirely sure uh, i knew that he liked to bug me uh by behaving like that um but for him, you know, painting was a completely immersive uh, experience. He would uh, get so caught up in each piece, attending to every precise detail with exacting skill and accuracy. And he would actually do a lot more paper research than he would spend time actually drawing because it really mattered to him. He considered himself an illustrator above all things. So he wanted everything to be historically accurate for the time. Um, you know, so, so he would spend so much time uh, in, in getting all the details right. You know, but my dad, he was just a man. My dad was just a man, a creative driven man, but a man nonetheless, you know, but watching his attention to every color, every shade, every character, every expression, every blade of grass, every sky he would paint, every tree, every field he would render, it kind of gave me a little bit of a sense of how God kind of hovers over his creation, how he broods over his creation, taking such care to get everything right. 
you know, creating the systems that made life possible on this planet, uh, creating gravity. What a great idea, gravity, right? Placing the moon as it is that gives us the tides as they are. Um, it's said that the universe and this planet Earth are so incredibly finely tuned that even slight variables could have prevented life on Earth from being possible. Here's, um, here's just a little idea of what I mean. Um, you know, so it's kind of locational fine tuning, like where we are really matters. And, and so, so we're just the right relationship to the sun, just the, the right distance from the sun, the right balance and the right tilt from the sun in order for the sun to either not provide not enough heat and we freeze us out or way too much heat and burn us out. Right. So that's that's um, part of the fine tuning. Other, another part is just the right atmospheric conditions, right? The right gravitational pull. Moon has something to do with that. The right amount of gas proportions, right? Kind of oxygen in the air. Uh, that's more of God's fine tuning. Um, you know, just let me just move me there. Just the right amount, um, uh, you know, the, the right moon, which is just the right distance from the earth, uh, just the right size, just the right rotation. Um, you know, all these things God set in motion. And, and then just the right uh, terrestrial uh, uh, crust, the right crust thickness and mineral composition on the earth to provide for life and then to provide all the stuff we need, like, you know, iron ore, all those things, all those things. So what's really interesting to me is that the psalmist links the fact that God is the maker of heaven and earth with what? If you look at, at your scripture, he, he, he links the fact that God is maker of heaven and earth with God's faithfulness. God's creative power is tied to his faithful character. And as great and mighty and enormous as his uh, authorship over all creation is, so is the greatness of his faithfulness. Sit with that for a moment. As impressive as all that is created is, so is the greatness of his faithfulness. And so while the psalmist recognizes God as a creator, you know, of all things, all material things, it's really important to us, obviously, but it's God's fidelity, it's God's faithfulness that is really the most impressive thing of all. Throughout all the ages, God remains consistent. And this is how his faithfulness is celebrated in, in this psalm. And, and interestingly, this is where it touches down in, its, in our lives. It's where the almighty creator God connects with you and me, right? So, so we're, we're given them um, here in the rest of the passage, kind of a montage of uh, contrasts, right? It, um, so let me just go back to that. Just give me a sec here. Um, if I can find that passage. Oh, no, I can't do that. Shoot. Uh, oh, here we go. Look at that. Okay. Let me move me. There we go. So we're given this, this, these contrasts. God's faithfulness is expressed in justice for the oppressed, upholding the cause of the oppressed. He gives food to the hungry. He sets prisoners free. He gives sight for the blind. He raises the humble who are bowed down. Uh, God loves the righteous, uh, the ones who live to participate with him in his purpose of justice that has just been listed in the scripture. Uh, he protects the stranger. He cares about the stranger. He watches over the foreigner. He sustains the widow and the orphan, and there's just so many examples of this in the whole Bible, Old and New Testament. See, see, this is to extol God. The purpose of this is to extol God. It is about that. But it's also, its purpose is to also motivate us, God's children, to imitate his behavior. All those um, disadvantaged in any way are objects of God's special concern, right? So these behaviors, these ways are, are, are characteristic for God. They're part of who he is, but they're kind of pretty uncharacteristic for, for, for humans. God is different from any and all cre uh, cre creatures. Um, certainly princes crowned or self-designated do not always secure justice for the oppressed or feed the hungry or, or free prisoners. Often they're just out to make life better for their friends. They're not about giving sight to the blind, raising up the lowly, loving the righteous, protecting strangers and widows and orphans. But all of this is literally and figuratively true of God. 
God is especially concerned with those who are spurned or ignored by others because of their lack of power and their position in society. Oops. In verse 10, it says, the Lord reigns forever. Uh, so even the, the main kingly or prince, princely function, that of maintaining justice and good order, that's done so much better by, by God than by any human. No earthly king or prince can compare to him. And so God deserves the praise, not humans. The story of Saul in the Old Testament um, is, is in part the story of God wanting to be really the direct intimate ruler of the people of God, to be so close, so welcome, that he would guide each person and thus would guide the nation by his presence, right? God knew that earthly kings would fall far short of his character and justice. Um, every, every, king, every king that had ever lived had proven that. And there's a particularly uh, poignant, kind of hard, difficult scene in 1 Samuel 8, where the leaders of Israel come to Samuel, who's a really, really important leader and prophet in Israel. And all of the elders um, of Israel gathered together to come to Sa uh, Samuel, and they said this. They said, appoint for us a king to judge us, like all the nations. But this, this thing displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, obey the voice of the people in all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. So this is very moving, I find. Um, you know, the story of Israel is a very long and, and, and convoluted one, and a bunch of us are reading through the Old Testament right now as we're reading through the Bible in a year. But it's, honestly, it's really worthwhile spending time reading it, because as much as it is important history, um, it, it reflects humanity in general. And that really means that it reflects the human heart. It reflects the journeys of our own hearts. And in this one passage, we see the human heart expressed in the plea from the elders. They were seeking a savior other than the savior. They were seeking a leader other than the one who rules with total justice. They were seeking their own king rather than having God as their immediate king. They didn't want that. You know, God who is closer than our own breath, who wants to lead us, who knows the way, God who knows the way. He wants to be the one to direct our paths because he knows the way. He who has the power, in, uh, all the power in the universe at his disposal because he made it, it came from him. He wants to fill you and your life with his power. Well, why does he want to do that? Why does he want to do that? Is it, what's up with that? Is, is God some kind of control freak? No, no. The only reason is that he loves you and he wants you to have your life set on a good path and not just a good path because sometimes uh, the good can be the enemy of the best. God wants to set your life upon the best path possible. And that path is with Jesus as your leader, the presence of Jesus as your guide. He is a person who loves you the most. He is the one who loves your soul, who came to redeem your life from devastation, the devastation that this broken world has inflicted or can inflict. You know, David said, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil because you are with me, right? You're with me. Why do we have to fear evil? Why do we have to fear no evil? Well, we do right to fear evil if we have no spiritual or moral compass, right? We're lost at sea if we have no moral compass. Uh, we're lost at sea without a solid anchor to hold us. But Jesus Christ is that anchor. Jesus is our spiritual and moral compass. And not only does he tell us what is right, but the gospel show us what is right, because in them we see Jesus, God in the flesh, speaking about what is right and rebuking what is evil. He's doing justice. We see him doing justice, showing kindness, loving the humble, identifying with everybody. And then at a certain point, he says this. He says, greater love is no one than this, than that he lays down his life for his friends. Those are powerful words. It's an awesome sentiment. You know, yes. We can imagine, I can imagine his original disciples thinking to themselves at that point, yeah, giving up my life would be the greatest expression of love. Hmm. But, you know, nothing Jesus said did he just say. He was not just a wise man who made uh, pithy, powerful statements that sounded true, you know, at a gut level. 
a short while after saying those words, Jesus, God in the flesh, the God of Jacob, the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. Jesus, the one who remains faithful forever. Jesus, the one who upholds the cause of the oppressed and gives food to the hungry, who sets the prisoners free and gives sight to the blind, who lifts up those who are bowed down, who loves the righteous and loves the sinner, who watches over the foreigner and sustains the fatherless and the widow. This same Jesus, author and sustainer of everything, went to the cross. He agonized in the garden, you know, seeking, if it was possible, another way to reclaim you and me for God. But then very shortly bowing to the Father's will, uh, he submitted himself to the humiliation, as we hear in the Gospels, the humiliation of a bogus trial, a rigged legal procedure. He endured mocking, being stripped and beaten, and then mounted upon a cross, nails to his hands and feet. And there he is hanging like a common criminal, the creator of heaven and earth, the creator of the sun being scorched by the sun he had made, the creator of oxygen fighting for oxygen that he had created, ridiculed by the leaders who he had formed in their mother's wombs, taking upon himself all of our shame, all of our pain, every humiliation and injustice. Perfect, matchless Jesus, creator of everything. So profoundly suffered for the sins of humanity that, that the Bible says that he who knew no sin became sin for us. Why? It's because he loves. It's because he loves you. It's because he loves me. Now, I don't know, some people hear the gospel, and it just doesn't connect, it doesn't touch down. Two people hear the same thing, you hear the same truth, see the same evidence, hear the same testimonies. One could care less, moves on to the next distraction. The other one, well, I remember my jaw dropping when I first heard and started to understand the gospel, even though my knowledge was very limited at the time. I remember realizing for the first time that I was loved by the one who was my maker and redeemer. So as best I, as I could at the time, I said, yes. I said, yes, to Jesus, not realizing that everything changed in that moment, that the path of my life, which was really, really headed into bad places, but the path of my life was altered when Jesus entered in and began directing my path. You know, if you know Jesus truly as your Lord and Savior, that means you seek to love him and you seek to obey him in all things. And you know exactly what I'm talking about. You have your own experience of transformation because of what happened to you when you received Jesus as your Savior and when you became a child of the living God. But you know what? If you're here online with us and you don't yet know him, if you haven't asked him to enter into your life, if you haven't received him, I do want to give you an opportunity to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, as the king of your life, as the one you'll follow all the days of your life because he is calling you. He is saying, follow me. I'm going to pray a prayer, and if you want to, if you want to, you can pray after me, okay? Dear God in heaven, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I acknowledge to you that I am a sinner, and I am sorry for my sins. I believe that your only begotten son, Jesus Christ, shed his precious blood on the cross of Calvary and he died for my sins. And I am now willing to turn away from my sins in repentance. You said in your word that if we confess the Lord our God and believe in our hearts that God raise Jesus from the dead, we shall be saved. And right now, I confess Jesus Christ as the Lord of my soul. With my heart, I believe that God raised Jesus from the dead. In this very moment, this very moment, I accept Jesus Christ as my own personal Savior. And I thank you, God, that now, according to your word, because of the faith that you have given me, I am saved. Thank you, Jesus, for your unlimited grace, which has saved me from my sins. 
I thank you, Jesus, that your grace leads to repentance. Lord Jesus, transform my life so that I may bring glory and honor to you alone and not to myself. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for me and for giving me eternal life. Amen. Amen.